exam, but my prep course next week. Um, so this is probably what I'm thinking about. Um, the lecture exam will actually be in two parts. Um, part one's general information, part two will be uh, life cycles. So part one will include like disease names. So I'll ask you, you know, what what parasite causes Karayama fever? Or I could ask you uh, what common disease is caused by schistosoma, right? So knowing those relationships, knowing the common names, uh, knowing uh, you know, definitions that, that we have, knowing functions, right? So we'll, we'll have those. Uh, Possibly adaptations, so it could have general questions about which of these are adaptations that increase transmission, right? Not necessarily specific to a life cycle, but you know, it's, it's they can they can apply. You know, there's other species that exhibit those types of adaptations, uh, and then for our uh, second part, the life cycles, what will likely be done is I'll have more the You'll have questions, let's say it's out of, it's 50 points, but in the grade book, it'll only, only be out of like 40 points. Because in, in years past, when we've actually taken the exam on paper, I've asked you to diagram, I've asked students to diagram the life cycles. I know we have a lot of life cycles, especially this, this semester, we've got a lot of life cycles. Uh, so when I asked them to diagram life cycles, I always gave them a choice. So say, diagram, one of these life cycles, and, and I gave them the option between, let's say, schistosoma mans and I, and Dipylobotrium later. So you had your choice of which life cycle to draw based on how confident you feel about it. All right, so to kind of replicate that, well, the life cycle part will be out of fewer points. So it's kind of like some extra points built into account for that, that the fact that you might not have answered uh, a question about, about that life cycle. Right, uh, and those would be those would both be due, or if they'd go live at the same time, they'd both be due at the same time. Uh, lab practical, uh, I think there's a way to do extra credit. I've always had extra credit on the lab exam, um, so if there is an easy way to do it, you'll see it because I think it just marked the questions as extra credit. Uh, I, I believe that. They did. They had it in the top hat. They could do that. I have to look in the blackboard. Uh, but if not, then we'll. I'll have to manually go and look at a couple of the questions. And normally, those those are questions about parasites that you haven't seen that weren't available in the lab, just to kind of assess your understanding, recognition of the parasites and so forth. All right. Typically, there's four or five extra credit points that, that are on the on the practical. All right, so that goes live next week. It looks like a marker, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Green marker. Get that erase. Yeah. Somebody needs to do a better job of erasing it. Or just put a chalkboard. Chalkboard. All right. Here's that you use. Check that out. Fatal flaw in parasites armor could be used to treat malaria. We'll learn about malaria. Uh, near the end of the semester, so that's a, what, like three weeks away? <laughs> How things are going? Uh, you've heard of malaria. I know you've looked at slides of, of malaria and zoology. If you had zoology, uh, problem with a lot of these protozoans is that we don't have vaccines. And quite frankly, we probably won't ever have vaccines against against these guys. The coevolutionary arms race is just too fast. These guys find a way, all right? But we do have drugs that, that can treat it. Unfortunately, so with most things, oftentimes drugs get overprescribed, or in the case of these protozoans, parasites, there's so many of these, these parasites, individuals, uh, in the host body, the chance that there's a mutation that conferred protection against that drug is high, right? The, the individual mutation developing, that probability is super low, but when you're dealing with a million plus parasites in there, 
if you have a 0.01% chance of actually developing that mutation, it's possible you're going to see at least one parasite, which then that parasite survives and then gives rise to the next generation. So we've got this issue with, with malaria where drugs have been prescribed, we're seeing drug resistance. A classic example of drug resistance developed where uh, I believe it was India laced their salt supply with an, uh, an anti-malarial drug and resistance developed within like months because everyone's getting it regardless of, of, of infection status. So what this group of researchers uh, have done is that you can alter what is in the cells itself. So you basically take the cells, if you can find a way to increase calcium and decrease the amount of cholesterol, it kind of sends a signal to the immune system that says, hey, clear me out, and in doing so, it clears out the parasite. So, I think there's there's possibility of, as an alternative. It would be hard for the parasite to adapt to that because it needs to get inside our, our blood cells, our red blood cells. But uh, it's interesting. It's, it's an interesting idea. So this popped up. This was March 5th today. Uh, but I thought it was, was kind of interesting. All right, so oh, we've got <laughs> nematodes. So we are moving on. Uh, your book, I think, talks about acanthocephalins first. Other books talk about nematodes first. Um, kind of depends on how you look at it, what we could have done. I've always done nematodes because most of our slides that we have for the next section are all nematodes. We have a couple of acanthocephalins that, uh, that we have prepared uh, in our lab. But, uh, mostly it's nematodes. So these are the roundworms. Uh, if you've had zoology, you've talked about these. All right, so this is a very, very numerous group. Right, there's anywhere from 16,000 to 20,000 described species. This includes both the parasitic and free living types, uh, types of species. Uh, they are so numerous that they say if you take the nematodes, you can coat the entire globe with individuals. It's a, a foot thick, a meter thick. And there's a huge number of nematodes out there. Now, this is probably an underestimate, or I should say. This is the third, this places the nematode third behind the arth arthropods and the mol uh, mollusca in terms of described species, so very speciose group. However, I do put propose that AP complexins might actually be even more uh, because AP complexins do show a lot of host specificity. So even between two different, two different species in the same genre, you could have two different AP complexins. That infect them, but again, kind of difficult to uh, describe these AB complexins when they are very, very small microparasites. Now, the sixteen to twenty thousand is likely a severe underestimate uh, because in order to describe these species, they had to be fine, found at first. They then had to be studied, and they had to be easily distinguished between other individuals of the same species or the same groups. Unfortunately, in the nematodes, the external morphology is relatively uniform. With, and, and this includes the internal morphology too, which makes separation of species pretty difficult. In some of our identifications, you actually need SEM imagery just to find out the pattern of their sensory structures on their head or on their tail or so forth. So we probably have an underestimate of how many described species out there, but it doesn't really matter. Key point here is that there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them out there. Now, this is probably an old group. It's probably been associated with, with organisms for a very long time. However, we don't have very many fossils. Why is that? They don't have a hard body. Yeah, they don't have hard hard body structures. Right? They're soft. They're soft bodies. Now we do have some fossils. The oldest fossil goes back 30 to 50 million years before present. We do have some information uh, for finding eggs uh, in mummies and so forth. So we know the oldest known human roundworm dates to at least 2700 BC. It's been mentioned in uh, historical documents. All right, uh, Ebers papyrus. Right? It's been mentioned about treatments of nematodes. So you know we know they've been associated with humans for at least 2700 uh, years. Uh, BC, but probably even longer than that. Now, I will give you a, a preview that most parts of the worm exhibit something called utility. 
which is a nuclear or cellular constancy. So in this, the, when the individual is born, it basically has the same number of cells. Now, I do say most parts of the worms because there are exceptions. There are exceptions. But if you're not going to exhibit mitosis in order to grow in size, then the only way to grow in size is for the individual cells to enlarge. And we see this in the, in the nematodes. It's not the only group that does this, but nematodes do do this. In this group, there's several feeding strategies. Um, so this is among a free living, or even those that are uh, parasitic but have free living stages. So oftentimes we see them as being detritivores or bacteriovores. The detritivores are going to be the de decomposers. They consume organic material. They play a very large role in nutrient recycling in the ecosystem. We can go out and grab some mud. Uh, at, at the bottom of the pond, and you're going to find hundreds of nematodes. All right. They're all playing a role in nutrient recycling. You can find them in soils. Of course, dry soils, less likely to find them. But if you go into forest, uh, forest floor where, where the ground, where the soil stays damp or slightly moist, you're going to find a lot of nematodes. Some of them are these detritivores, others are the bacteriovores that are feeding on the bacteria that are breaking down this stuff. All right, so kind of both together, we, you know, they're, they're important in nutrient recycling. Now with the bacteriovores, oftentimes these have very powerful esophagus and pharynx. Esophagus and pharynx are basically the same thing as she said, pharyngeal bulbs. They have a powerful feeding apparatus because they're sucking in the bacteria, and in some cases, they need to like, suck in and rupture the bacterial wall to feed on their contents. Some of our nematodes are parasites, and that kind of changes what their feeding styles will be. So for the plant parasites, we know some of them. We typically study the ones that, are, that, are, that affect humans, so they're important parasites of our crops or perhaps you know, flowers, rose, roses, and so forth, all right? So they can have a significant impact on the crops just by burrowing into them, doing damage, uh, especially to the roots, uh, but also they carry viruses, so they can transmit viruses between the plants. Vertebrate parasites, these are gonna be ones that we focus on. Uh, these, some of these have caused significant pathology. Others probably wouldn't know you have. Then we have others that are entomopathogenic. These are those that, that kind of infect insects, utilize insects. And uh, we actually make use of these guys to try to control insect problem, uh, populations, control insect pests. So you go down to uh, Olive's nursery, I believe he sells nematodes that will just kind of sprinkle into the soil. Nematode eggs, or I think, is what they're, they're, but you can buy. Or you can buy them online. I can't remember what, 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 they, what they target. Snails, slugs, uh, definitely use some to, to control snails and slugs. Several papers that we've done. Now, our nematodes are going to range in size. Some of them are less than a millimeter. Others are greater than a meter. And of course, we've got our gigantic ex exception, the Centinema gigantisma. Uh, this guy got its name for size and location. So it infects or is found in the placenta of sperm whales. These are a centima. Uh, Females can get up to eight meters long. If you're going to get that big, you're also going to be somewhat wide, so two and a half centimeters, so almost an inch wide. Can you imagine that thing in your gut? Jeez, I think you'd feel it. 
you feel it moving. But thankfully, it doesn't go inside of us. Do you have? You know, most of them are, are this tube shape, but some of them can kind of get this large, bulbous shape. Um, that is a, a uh, tetrameres, uh, that is a parasite of the bird. All right. General morphology. Basically a naked cylinder. It's a long tube. Now, the shape of that tube can vary in, in basic thickness and, and in total length. So oftentimes we can refer to some as fusiform, which would be more spindle-like. Spindle uh, you would say more stout-like worm. Uh, or you could have filiform, which is more of a thread-like uh, worm. Thin, you know, long and thin. These worms are pseudocoelomates. Dig back into your bio one and two classes, or I guess developmental. I think zoology talks about it too. Right. You know, specific for this is you do have a body cavity, but it's not a true body cavity. It's not a cavity that is uh, lined by uh, exophysium. What's that? One billion, billion. Yeah. So, you know, specific is that our body cavities that derive from the embryonic blastocoel. This is kind of important to know that we have this body cavity because it's going to be fluid filled. And we're going to see this again in the, acanth in the acanthocephalans. All right, that fluid filled body cavity is going to have some rigidity to it. It's going to be under pressure, which then kind of provides uh, a skeleton. It's a hydrostatic skeleton. Right? So it gives support so on which the muscles can act and allow movement. Now the body is mostly uniform. Really no distinct division. Not like our, our tapeworms where you have a scolex, neck, you know, and strobola. Or like your monogenes where you have your proactor and your opus pistaptor. We don't have that. A lot of times these nematodes are going to be difficult to identify the head and the tail if they don't have any sort of distinguishing features on it. Right now, those, we'll, we'll pull out some. Uh, I have plenty of, of vials and nematodes, and, and we'll, we'll see it. We'll, we'll pull some out, and we'll look at them just underneath the dissecting scope, you know, them preserved, and you'll see how difficult it is to identify anterior and posterior. But if we start looking at the internal structure, then things will start to become a little bit easier, because we can see the actual esophagus and the Rimpial bulb in some cases, we can see the intestines, we can see the, the, the anus. All right, if we do have variation in this external morphology, we see it at either the head or the tail region. That's most likely where we will see this variation. We will see some of this variation in our specimens. Just a reminder, I have handouts posted. Check them out. And on the handout, this, this picture is actually rotated because that's how it, it initially appeared. All right, so the anterior end. Usually, these anterior ends possess six, or they possess limbs. So in this case, we have three limbs. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here. And they can have anywhere from zero to six, so some limbs don't have any, others have up to six. Uh, the six-way symmetry is called hexamerous symmetry. So every lip looks like all of the others. Think of it, take a circle, divide it up into sixths, and mirror images of, of, of all each other. I'd say, you know, think of the pizza that's sliced, but man, whoever makes the pizzas always do things lopsided. Right? This is probably the ancestral trait, is having these, these six lips. 
And then what has happened is that we have, we've had fusion of the lips. Most common type of fusion is where you have two lips fused to begin one, which then leads to a triradiate symmetry or a three-way symmetry. That's what this is. So we've got our three lips here. This is triradiate symmetry. And again, whatever the structures are, the specific structures, we can kind of make out these papillae. There's a papillae there, there's one there, uh, or maybe there's two, maybe I'm missing two. Uh, but if it's right in the middle on this one, it's going to be in the middle on this lip and on this lip. So they're, they're very symmetric. Now, these lips open into a buccal capsule. All right. So the mouth is like the opening. You can say it's defined as the opening itself. Right, right up there. It opens into a buccal capsule. The buccal capsule is a portion of that mouth that is lined by a cuticle. Right. And it can be sclerotized or a type of hardened lining. Right. But this is going to be part of the cuticle. So the cuticle is on the outside of the worm and actually goes up into the buccal capsule. And also it ends up going into the first part. The, the foregut is what they would term it. Fairings, pharyngeal ball, and so forth. And I do have that on later slides. Now, the buccal capsule could be highly modified, and we are going to see this modification. All right? If it's highly modified, it could be modified for attachment purposes. It could be modified for feeding purposes. And I do have, I left this here, note the cervical alley, these wing-like structures. They'll, they'll pop up down here. All right. All right, so at this anterior end, we have sensory organs. And in this diagram, this shows the hexamerous symmetry, the six-way symmetry. All right, so now the sensory organs that, that we have in the nematodes is three main types. Uh, I should say probably two main types. But I break it into three. So amphids is one. These are chemosensory in nature. These are typically, these are paired organs. They've been derived from cilia. So the cilia is actually what, what is the chemosensory that goes into a pit. So amphids are, are kind of glandular type cells that have this chemo, chemosensory ability. on them. Now, they don't always have to be secretory in nature, but they can be. So a lot of them are secretory. Uh, what is their function? Unknown. Unknown. They, we, I think there's been some suggestions as to what it could, could be used for, but uh, it's unknown. So amphids are basically pits, chemosensory pits. The pili, or bristles, are the tactile reception, the mechanoreception. And these papillae or bristles can be broken down based on their location on that anterior region. So we have labial papillae. These are on the lips at the anterior. All right. These could also be fused. So if we had fusion of the lips, you could also have had fusion of these papillae. And then a little bit further back, uh, we have inner and outer on this diagram. A little bit further back, you have these cephalic papillae or the, or the bristles. All right, that's typically where, when we find these cephalic papillae, they're typically at the level of our amphids. And then posterior to that are the darids. The darids. These are the most posterior of the anterior receptor, so still towards the anterior part. So, what is cervical? Like if we look for the cervical region in human anatomy, where is it? The neck region. So yeah, kind of think think about that. Or the cephalic region, what? And yeah, kind of the same type, same type of principle. 
So the main sensories at the anterior end are these amphids and these papillae or bristles. Right. Additional modifications are possible. So you can have the appearance of spines on certain limbs. Uh, and we do see some, some of these spines. I think I have. Uh, I, I mentioned spines as part of a hold fast. Uh, we can have lateral or cephalic alley. That's what these were. Right. Cervical alley. These are cuticular wing like expansions. So they're expansions of the actual cuticle giving these wings. Function probably in movement or probably in uh, attachment, probably aids in keeping the worm in place. And then we can also have cuticle that's that form ridges so not you don't have spines or anything but they form ridges and these ridges are called are called uh sin lobs symbopi sin lobby they i think technically sin that's how i've heard cuticular ridges and again, why have these cuticular ranges? Maybe it has something to do with, with locomotion or kind of grasping on to microvilli or a lot, giving some resistance to microvilli to resist the movement of food through the gut. Possibility. And I say that because with our uh, alley, uh, you can have spike projections, especially in larval worms. And, and when they've looked at movement of larval worms, they moved on their sides where those ridges are. Uh, so giving the idea that perhaps these ridges are, are helping in locomotion. <clears throat> Moving to the posterior, we've got some sensory structures. Probably shouldn't have had caudal alley on that as a sensory structure. Let's move that. Go. So phasmids. Ooh, hold on. I missed this. The phasmids in bold. Phasmids are similar in structure and function to amphids, but they're at the posterior end. So this is where that two or three types come into play. Some people would call the phasmids a separate type. I don't know, I think amphids and phasmids are the same thing, just their name tells us if it's at the anterior end or the posterior end. We also have papillae. These are mechanical reception and they can vary. So you've got your anal papillae here in this one. Where's my, there it is. The tail of this worm. Uh, I believe I have some prepared slides where you can make out the papillae that run a length down the caudal alley, which again, they could have. If they have it, typically it's gonna be smaller, not as wide, the extensions aren't as, as, as extensive as a cephalic alley. Their function could be possibly for movement, but if it's in the male, those alley could actually act as a grasper to hold the female during population. Now, highly modified ends of some of these worms uh, have a bursa. So the end has this copulatory bursa. It's found in males, not in females. Right? And its function is to grasp the female during insemination. And there's going to be a diversity of structures. We'll see some that have rays. All right. Have, we'll see some that have, have rays. Uh, and these are probably some of the most well-developed of the bursa. But then we also have some that are minimal, which is just like an extension of the caudal alley that, that acts as kind of like just a hold, something that can grip just a little bit longer, a little bit more. Questions? Speciatory attachment structures are uncommon in this group. Now we've finished up with the platyhelminths and you've seen the diversity of those structures. You know, the scolex types, you know, within each type have the possibility of rostellum and hooks and all that stuff, or, or the trematodes, you know, 
the, the monogenes and spitic adstrians, you got a lot of different attachment structures. But in the nematodes, specialized structures are pretty uncommon. But they do have, have some exceptions. Right? And oftentimes, you're going to see these exceptions in those organisms that are under a lot of selection pressure to remain in a specific location, most likely in the GI tract where they have to resist the movement of food through the gut. So the movement of food could be actually pretty thick and blocky. So in some of these worms that have to deal with this, we see modifications. In the hookworms, for example, we have the buccal capsules modified to be sclerotized into plates or teeth that they can then kind of use to clamp on and hold on to. Also, so that's kind of as the holdfast. We use them because these are cutting plates and teeth that allow the hookworm to actually cut the epithelial cell to allow the host to bleed so it can feed on the blood. Trichurus, that should be italicized. Oh, it should be italicized. Uh, Trichurus is whipworm. We'll talk, we'll talk about that. This has a thin thread-like anterior end. So it's not like stouter like this. It has a very thin, long type of anterior end that it embeds in the gut epithelial tissue. So it's embedded and then like the stout posterior half is out free in the lumen of the gut. Spinatectus carolini, which I know I have some. I haven't been able to find the bottles. But these guys have concentric rings of spines. And that's one of their, their defining features. So they're more heavily concentrated at the very anterior end, and then they taper off as we go posterior. All right, they use this because they embed their anterior end in uh, the gut mucosa. And those hooks that are pointing backward help kind of anchor it in place so it doesn't move as the food is getting pushed through. Now these are the out the apparent ones, the ones we can see uh, with the microscope. But there's also biochemical holdfasts going on here. So these are secretions, polypeptide-like proteins uh, that all that are, that are secreted by the worm that reduce the peristaltic action of the gut. And it's just in that area where the worm is. All right, so it's not like the entire gut just in that area where the worm is. So as, it, as the food's getting pushed through, the muscles are going to be fairly weak acting in those locations. So we kind of think your book talked about biochemical hold fast. Now we got to fix that. This just bothers me. You can tell it, man. I, I finished, just finished this up last night. I was you tore through those life cycles. I'll be clear. Yeah, she should have told me to slow down. <laughs> All right, cool. Save that. Fix that. Thalicides and polypeptide. Like protein. So, yeah, that's not my picture of Spin Texas, but I do know I have a couple pictures of those. And I was under the gun to try to get some. Get these finished. All right, body wall and cuticle. This is different. So, platy helmets was all syncytial tegument. The nematodes actually have a cuticle. And the cuticle is this multi-layered exoskeleton. That is essentially its, its function. Cuticle is a collagenous extracellular matrix that's secreted by the underlying syncytial epidermal cells. So the epidermal cells do tend to be syncytial in nature, and then they secrete this collagen, or collagen-like uh, molecules that form this cuticle. Now the cuticle is going to cover the entire body, the entire outer body, along with some parts of gastrointestinal tract. So like buccal capsule, foregut, and hindgut. And again, well, that, that's on in later slides. This cuticle is composed of several different layers. The outermost layer is this, is this epic cuticle. It's a very outermost layer. 
This is going to be a lipid rich layer. Now, we could have said that's not necessarily, that's actually the second layer, because what these worms will also do is secrete a protein rich layer that kind of coats that outside. The lipid rich is kind of still part, part, of, the, part of your cuticle. It's this protein rich layer that's produced by the gland cells uh, and glands of the excretory system that kind of coats the worm further. And I believe we can kind of get rinse those off, not so much with the lipid layer. Uh, the purpose of this protein layer is all about immune evasion in some species. You can kind of uh, inhibit some, some reactions, break down, break down uh, receptors that, that are coming to tag the one and so forth. Lipid rich epicuticle also prevent, pre, is a barrier. So you know, lipids are hydrophobic, right? So it's going to keep some of the hydrophilic stuff out. Underneath that is the cortical zone. This is the, the part of our cuticle. Actually, no, uh, the cuticle is composed of the cortical, median, and basal zone. So this all part here represents the cuticle proper above the basement membrane. So this cuticle is non-cellular in nature. It's made up of proteins, mostly collagen, <laughs> mostly collagen. And it consists of these three different zones. So the outer zone of the cuticle is the cortical zone. Uh, a lot of collagen, collagen-like compounds there. It's providing some strength. It's providing some uh, resistance to diffusion and so forth. The median la layer shows little structure. We know it's made of collagen, but it doesn't have as much structure as what we see in the cortical zone or in this basal zone. And I think the basal zone is kind of uh, most, of, probably the most important part because it's made up of collagen fibers, but they're parallel fibers in different layers. All right. So the fibers themselves don't expand. They can expand. But they're arra they are arranged in such a way so that they're parallel one way and then parallel in another way. And even though you won't get stretching along their one axis, you can get shifting over top of those layers. All right? The angle in which they're at varies. And it could be, I hate to say diagnostic, all right? Because you really have to get in and do some EM work to, to see some of this stuff. But it's an interesting part. This arrangement confers an incredible amount of strength and rigidity to that cuticle while still allowing them to move. All right, so you're not going to get like stretching of, of that, but you can get movement. And it's this part, this entire cuticle, which is very tough, very resistant to host immune, immune responses, very resistant to some, uh, some external, external chemicals, external conditions. Uh, I think our book describes goes into a little bit more detail on each of these if you're curious. At the bottom is the basement membrane. That's going to separate our cuticle from the epidermis that ultimately secretes it. All right. That epidermis is going to be where the muscles connect. All right. Now the musculature, how it connects, is rather interesting. All right, this isn't necessarily unique to the file, all right? but it's unusual. All right, so in these muscles, we have two distinct parts. So here's our muscle fiber. We've got two. If anyone's watching or it's getting recorded. This is a muscle fiber. This is a muscle fiber. All right, so in the two parts, we have the contractile U-shaped projection. Right, our striated muscles down here, that's going to be where we can get, get our uh, some bar contraction. And then you're going to have the cell body itself. And the cell body is, is non-contractile. So if you looked at muscle cells before, you can see the nucleus, right? And you can see all your, your striations, your H zones and, and everything else. Well, that's our, that's our myocyton, our cell body of the muscle. Now, from this body, we have these two arm-like projections from that muscle that embed into the actual nerve, nerve cord. 
That part is the unusual part. We don't typically see that, right? Because what do we see? What do we typically see? Who's had anatomy? You know, our, our one student had it. She's not here. She'd know it. Like a motor unit? What's that? Like a motor unit? Yeah, what is that? Well, no, no, technically not the motor units. I mean, does our muscle cells, do they embed into the nerve? No. No. The nerve cells kind of embed into the muscles. The, our axons, right, go out and they innervate the muscles. Our muscles here attach right directly to that, to that nerve cord. So that's pretty unusual. Pretty unusual. All right. So... As so we say, just kind of pay attention. All muscles in the lower hemisphere. So there's going to be a dorsal and ventral nerve cord. Uh, there's also some less prominent lateral cords. But all the muscles in the lower part, in the dorsal, on the ventral side, attach to the ventral nerve cord. All the muscles on the dorsal side connect to the dorsal nerve cord. So, and again, it's through these myocytons and their arms. Pretty cool. All right, so what's the function of the cuticle? This kind of had to figure out where I was going to slip this. But protection from the environment, major one. Right? It's going to be impervious. It protects against digest digestion as the worm goes through the uh, stomach. Uh, it is going to protect against desiccation. Of course, some of these you know, thicker, thicker cuticles are more resistant to desiccation than thinner cuticles. All right, so, yeah. Just because you have a cuticle doesn't mean you're, you can't dry out. Right? This is also the first line of defense against the pathogens and host immune system. So nematodes can get attacked by viruses, could get attacked by, by some uh, bacteria. Right? The cuticle confers protection against those. And then, of course, for the parasitic ones, they're getting nailed by the host immune system, or they can get nailed by the host immune system. And the cuticles just kind of slough it off and say, you know what, hey, you can't touch me. It's like they're wearing armor. Right? Cuticle is also important for, for locomotion. So the muscles attach the epidermis of that cuticle. All right? And the arrangement of these collagen fi fibers allow you know, flexibility. So in terms of, you know, we don't have bones, but the cuticle is providing the support. So when a muscle contracts, it can actually pull part of that cuticle in. And then also for locomotion, it provides structural support for the hydrostatic skeleton. So you do have this fluid-filled pseudocoelom, all right? And the cuticle, based on its toughness, kind of keeps that under pressure, keeps it under pressure. Important thing for these cute, for these nematodes at least, and especially something new for us, is that in order for our worm to grow, the cuticle has to be molted. Just like an insect, right? If an insect's to grow, it's gonna have to molt. It molts it, it's exoskeleton. Crab, uh, crawfish, right? Crawfish boils are starting to get popular, right? Uh, in order for those to go to, to grow, they have to molt. And that's why this group, through sequence analysis, actually falls into a superphylum called the ectisozoa because of its ability to molt. And in terms of the cuticle structure itself, it's highly, highly conserved. All right, we're gonna see a little, only minor variation between species, between groups, with the exception of the angles. The angles and the number of layers of these uh, in your basal zone. All right, we had 11.45. I say, yeah, let's stop at our digestive system, and we'll pick up digestive system, reproductive system on Monday. So go ahead, look, look through this. Um, there will be a quiz once we finish this, but it, I think we'll, we'll make it do after, after all of our exams. So.
kind of look through it. If you haven't started looking at it, go through and look over your body helmets, start studying for the exam. You'll note that we have a lot of life cycle information. I do have the quizzes. Um, some of them I think everyone has taken, so the keys should be available. Um, but on Sunday night, that's our deadline for if you miss them and you want to get get it marked as a late, they take the late penalty. Sunday night's the end because I want to make sure everything's available. All the quizzes are available so you can see them and the All right. All right. Have a good weekend.